Jimmy Savile, once a cherished national icon, is now vilified as an evil sexual predator who hid behind a smokescreen of celebrity in a career that lasted decades. After running several nightclubs across the country, Savile began working as a DJ, first at Radio Luxembourg and then, in 1968, joining the BBC. One of his early roles was presenter of a topical radio discussion programme called Speakeasy. He was the presenter. It was uh, another one of Jimmy's PR operations, you know, Jimmy Savile is king, and he certainly was on that programme, as he was on everything he appeared on at the time. And within the BBC, the whole organisation was at his beck and call. Had a huge amount of power, he certainly knew it, and constantly worked on building it round him. In everything in life, he used it to get his own advantage. After the recording of one particular episode of Speakeasy, Dave was offered a lift home by Jimmy Savile. As they approached Leicester, Savile suggested they pull into a service area for a rest. So oh, he suggested he was going to get his head down for an hour, and as it was early evening, I said, fine, I'd go into the service area and have a meal. Did just that. Came back after about, oh, three quarters of an hour to an hour. Tapped on the window of the motorhome to let him know I was here and lo and, lo and behold two young girls 14 15 year olds clambered out of the back looking all scruffy and flustered followed by Jim they were scrambling as if they were trying to get away from something I know my suspicion but the fact is that they were running from something so he didn't say anything, the girls went away. We got back in the note home. I said, who were they? Oh, fans, it often happens. But then, total silence. Never said a word. The more and more I thought about it, I thought, I need to tell somebody what my suspicions are. Dave raised the matter with a colleague, but was shocked by the response. They had a word with his line manager who'd said, uh, it's Jimmy Savile, we can't do anything or say anything about that, you know, we both need to keep our jobs. After that, I never watched him on television once. If he came on television, I switched it off. I never watched another Jimmy Savile programme after that. In 1975, Savile began presenting the show that would make him a household name. Jim will fix it. The programme was broadcast on Saturday evenings and ran for almost two decades. At its peak, the show attracted viewing figures of 15 million, with the production team opening almost 5,000 letters a day. I got letters just bombarding me. There were so many letters and it was up to me to sift them and give them to Jim for his decision. But it was, it was hard, but there was a lot of letters and it just grew like Topsy. And that's how it all started. Despite his on-screen persona, Savile's attitude to children was apparently different when the cameras were turned off. He did not like children at all. He tolerated them. But that's about as far as it went for the value of the programme. I think all children should be eaten at birth. That's for sure. He had a set rules and he knew how far he could go. They might have sat on the arm of the chair, but that's as near as it got. What is apparent now, though, is that this seeming aversion to children was no more than a camouflage to ward off suspicion. A device Savile used throughout his life to stay ahead of the rumours that dogged him. Abusers often are the most credible and charming people that you could meet. They're often very hard-working. They often hold positions within authority, within society, of, of some standing. The other common denominator, of course, is that they are highly dangerous to children and can be highly dangerous when cornered. And I think that, you know, there was a man who clearly could be as charming as charming could be, but also was both highly dangerous, extremely threatening and very intimidating when he needed 
to be. And there's only one thing I can do now, and that's if you, if you cheat down there, Mr. Cameron, I still forget that. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. As well as his TV and radio career, Saville was renowned for his charity work, raising millions of pounds for several charities, including the Leeds General Infirmary and Stoke Mandeville National Spinal Injury Centre. Jim, because he was Jim, liked high profile things. Stoke Mandeville was very high profile. It was world famous for its treatment of the paralyzed. Leeds General Infirmary was a big teaching hospital. So he generated to things that had quite a high publicity value. And as a result, he benefited, but so did the hospitals. Jimmy Savile may have raised around 40 million in his lifetime for charity, but looking back, I think it's, it's easy to now see that his charity work was a very convenient camouflage for his activities and helped him gain access to vulnerable you know, young people, in fact, in hospitals, in children's homes, in events linked to the BBC, and indeed, of course, his involvement with Broadmoor and the fact that he was actually given the keys to Broadmoor. Broadmoor, the high security psychiatric hospital in Berkshire, is home to some of the UK's most notorious criminals. Past occupants include Peter Sutcliffe, Charles Bronson, and Ronnie Cray. Savile had volunteered at Broadmoor for years, but in 1988, he was given a senior role, along with a house on site, and incredibly, access to patients. The fact that he was given keys to a place such as Broadmoor, that he was allowed to walk the the hospital wards where there were vulnerable children in Stoke Mandeville and other places, again, is incomprehensible. And yet nobody, nobody seems to be taking responsibility. Like many adults who abuse children, I think Savile preyed on the vulnerable and the weak. We still don't know the full sort of degree of what he did, but it seems to be the case that he may have even abused disabled children in hospitals. We now know there were people you know, in certain hospitals and at Broadmoor and elsewhere who were suspicious or indeed had had whispers or even had had complaints from some victims, but who I think felt that they would never be believed. You know, if you're a friend of the Prime Minister, if you're photographed with these people, you are, you know, in the public eye the idea that you might at the same time be abusing children is monstrous. Here we go with what's called a medical breakthrough. He had, if you like, all the establishment connections, even though he was eccentric, even though he dressed like a complete weirdo, that he was actually, he was actually, he, he, he was actually fated. As well as having almost unrestricted access to Broadmoor and its patients, Savile also managed to secure regular visits to Duncroft School in Surrey, a residential school that housed young girls who had been sent there by the courts. The girls at Duncroft were certainly, although intelligent, were vulnerable. But Savile, I think, also worked on the principle that the mixture of his fame and the fact that he was treating them to things like trips to the BBC or trips out in his Rolls Royce, that this was if you like, a, a thrill that, you know, that, uh, they, that they wouldn't get from, uh, from their normal lives in, a, in effect in an institution. So I think, he, I think he gambled on that, that that would, inf at the time, would actually guarantee their silence. Anything that moved seemed to be a potential victim for Savile. But he clearly also was clever at targeting lots of very vulnerable victims as well. Girls in a school for troubled girls would have been, you know, manna from heaven. In 1994, two women who had been pupils at Duncroft approached the Sunday Mirror newspaper, alleging that Savile had abused them as teenagers. 
they weren't looking for money. They merely wanted to see Savile exposed because they thought you know, he was a he was a hypocrite and find it hard to believe that he was almost you know deified in some circles and that, and that he he was so well in with you know, very prominent eminent people. Although the paper was keen to run the story, the two women were understandably wary of the costly and emotionally intrusive libel case that would inevitably follow. They decided not to proceed. Once again, Savile's power and reputation had served him well. I had no doubt about the veracity of their stories, but they had lost their nerve. In one case, she still had the, the courage herself, but she didn't want the embarrassment of both her past life coming out and or indeed of her being subjected to uh, you know to what would have been a merciless uh, cross examination by a QC for Savile one had, would have had to tell them that was what was going to happen the second woman didn't want to be the, the lone witness but also said and I will never forget this because it, it I think, I think it reflects a theme that we now know was common among Savile's victims. She said, who's going to believe me, an ex-approved school girl against Jimmy Savile with all his fame, all his money, and that being a house guest of Margaret Thatcher at number 10 in Chequers. And with hindsight, one, one knew that she was probably right. Although we didn't, we didn't run the story, some weeks later, I had a phone call from a QC George Carman, at, at the time, than the most famous libel QC in Britain. George Carman, QC, was one of the country's leading barristers, acting for both celebrities and national newspapers. To the best of his family's knowledge, he had never formally represented Jimmy Savile. My father spoke to Paul Carnew. He was then editor of the Sunday Mirror. Uh, and my father had uh, worked with him in terms of giving uh, defamation advice in five or six different cases, I think. So he knew him reasonably well, and they'd also socialised a bit. So he phoned him to, on the pretext of talking about something to do with um, a libel action with reference to the mirror. And my understanding from Paul is that at the end of the conversation, my father, apropos of nothing, suddenly introduced an observation saying, Jimmy Savile's very grateful that you didn't publish that story about Duncroft, and Paul was astonished. I was, for a second, I think, taken aback that George Carman knew about it. Um, so my reaction you know, to George was, well, how do you know about it, George? You can only know because Savile's spoken to you, and he sort of gave a rather affirmative sort of chuckle, and... My response was, well, George, even though we, we couldn't prove the story because the two women involved lost their nerve, I actually believe them. And George Carver paused and chuckled again and said, Paul, I suspect you may well be right. I can quite understand he was astonished because, as far as he was concerned, only three people in the world knew about that story apart from the two girls. Uh, that was himself the legal advisor and the journalist who wrote the story. So the fact that my father knew about it, and therefore Savile knew about it, and that my father introduced it in conversation in this way, he found deeply surprising, as indeed do I. He had friends in the very highest echelons of society. Princess Diana and him were friends. Nobody messed with Jimmy Savile, because he had connections that were unique, if you like, to, to somebody in his position. It was like he was the puppet master controlling everything that was going on. By the end of the 1990s, after a glittering career, Savile's showbiz star was fading. And whilst his TV appearances grew less frequent, his near constant charity work earned him a knighthood. His armour of respectability was complete. It would be over 20 years later until the full, horrifying truth emerged. He enjoyed seeing pain inflicted and humiliation, I suppose. 